point about this is um, I can't go into details in 30 minutes, that's for sure. So we'll keep it at a level where we kind of see things that we did, and I want to point out what's really relevant in that, in that system, because it's not just trying to get the breach covered and, and, and kind of get off it, it's also what do we do as a learning out of it? What's the next step? Do we really understand? But before I start this, it's just uh, like a little bit on, on what I do or where I came from. I've been in that API security industry really since 2005, but it actually took off 2009, really, with API gateways and the first runtime protection systems. And since then, I basically went through different companies as trainer, pre-sales, implementer, in the API management API gateway world. And one of the reasons why I joined this company, 42 Crunch, about a year and a half ago was we're doing that testing and runtime protection since two decades nearly, and we still get breached weekly, literally weekly. Last breach, 6th of March, so not far away. What do we do wrong? And why are we get, still get breached? And this story here is basically a story of a company that reached out of us after a breach, in the desperate help, ask for help. Can you do something immediately? And then, of course, you say yes. You, know, you don't tell them, no, forget about it, it's done. Um, you try to help, but on the other side, you know exactly they will get the same breach again if you don't do something more than just helping. So the idea really was to find out what was the situation at the beginning. And part of that, what we started when we looked at this, we found something that was running a loyalty program on top of an e-commerce shop. So it's a relatively known exercise, actually. Um, they thought they were really good because they had phone numbers, they had OTPs, everything was good. So why they got breached? They found that the attacker was using actually valid tokens to exfiltrate data. So the question was, how do they get through that token? One of the reasons was they realized they were bypassing the single page application, which was actually driving that loyalty program system. So what do you do in case of a breach? <laughs> you probably all know this, this picture out of, link, out of LinkedIn. It, it, runs around a little bit more, but ah, it's one way to do it, <laughs> right? Um, the other one is, what can you do on a software level? First action, of course, is trying to get stop that, a API, that app from being actually used. No luck, it didn't help, because the attacker was not, was not attacking the, the single page application, it was attacking the underlying API. So the only way they could stop it, really, was saying, okay, can we block at web application firewall level, just the path, this specific path. We, could, we don't want to do something with the rest, but we want to really get, get stopped because they saw data flying out day in, day out. They couldn't stop it. So once they shut down the WAF, seems to be all good, but they already lost data. And of course, when you think of what a loyalty app is actually for, there was a constant daily revenue loss as long as this thing is offline. Well, and it was pretty prominent in that region. So it was a certain amount of money that they lost. So they had a pressure from the business saying, can you just do something about it to change the problem? That's basically when we came in and we asked them, OK, let's, let's do a little triage to find out what is the actual situation. So what happened? The first thing we realized, single page application developed by a full-stack developer. Sounds like a plan, right? Really cool guy, brings it up. I think you all have these guys there. The problem was he was actually not aware that he was using APIs. Because his framework was telling him to build the back end, and then magically gave him the information for the front end, and he did the front end in React, and it worked perfectly fine. And the whole testing was absolutely perfect. His security testing by trying to to not a phone number, to do a wrong OTP, all that worked. So he was pretty happy. Um, what's the problem of, an, of a single page application in general? I give a hacker 
basically a blue script of how the application works. I can look into the code and say, okay, this is my first step, this is my second step, I need to get this data in here to do this next call. So it helps attackers actually to go forward. And if that is not really there in terms of tight security, then the next trade was, okay, which uh, that application had about 40, 50 API calls in the back. So we needed to find out which one is it which actually compromises. How did they actually get to that real token? And why is it a token from someone else? So after looking a little bit at the log files and, and looked into what happened, we found this one. <laughs> so when we look at this at, at from, an, from an OWASP top 10 perspective, they were not alone. <laughs> it's, it's for reason it's number one. Because it's often and it's bad. <laughs> from what data exfiltration is. That corresponds to the, the top level. So now we had that situation, okay, we know there's a business object problem. How do you fix it? Right, that's, the, that's now the, the, the immediate point was game plan, offense, how do I fix it? I need to get this hacker off my back. So we had a, we had a really good situation in that in terms of when we joined the customer, we had a partner in there who was very trusted, and we asked for, can we have the right guys in the team? We don't need someone that asks for reporting. We don't need someone that tries to blame anyone. We need someone that can do the job if we ask for. It was critical, because if you want to do a game plan and you go forward and you have no right receiver in the team, Throw a pass in it, that's it. <laughs> Nothing happens, right? So, question was, can we, how can we identify where the real problem is? The first thing we did with them was building awareness by saying, hey, can we just take this API and build a specification on it so we actually understand what is the input, what is the output parameter? What is the application actually transferring as data? Can we define it? Can we make it visible? Because they hadn't, because the developer wasn't aware that he's using API, so there was no spec. That was our first step. And it also had the idea of what can we do in long term to help them over time. So if we have that open API specification as a standard set, they can use it further on. It's, nothing that's, it's not a one-off. It's something they start moving on. That's why we said, okay, let's start with there. So we described that open, that login and that OTP call from an open API specification, and we try to understand um, what can we do to, to optimize it. First of all, we understood the phone number on the input basically was just a string. We said, okay, phone numbers are very, very seldom strings. <laughs> In most of the cases, they were actually numbers. Like, it's not called phone number because it's a phone string. Right, so there was this kind of, can we do this? And then we went through a little bit of a, of a work with them, how can we remediate this? And one of the other things we wanted to see to remediate this, what would be a normal transaction volume for an OTP call, for a logging call? What's the, what's the normal? What happens, like not Black Friday, right? That's kind of, that's not what you want to look at. But what is the normal one? Is it five times a second? Is it 100 times a second? Is it a million a second? Where are we? What's the level? The idea behind this is, if you want to protect this in real time, you need to understand the motion of the data and how often and how fast this is moving. We use this information to basically start a real-time protection engine. That thing did two things. First of all, it took the open API specification as a whitelist. So blocking everything except what is defined in the open API specification eliminates false positives. They're not existing anymore. Then we took that same system and said, okay, the average income on the login is about five times a second, 10 times a second. We took a guesstimate because they really hadn't really all the data we wanted, but we had a, we had a good understanding. We said, okay, let's start with 10 times a second and see if that helps. If not, we can always tighten it a little bit more. 
the trick on this one is because it, because it was based on the open API standard, we didn't need to create any um, wild um, policies that we need to update manually. We only updated the open API specification. So we had one file, one governance file to work on. Made our life way easier because we needed only one specialist to look at the, the topic. Right? We needed one that understands open API specification. Not someone that understands the WAF, that understands the network, that understands, because we were only one at one point. And our, really, really the idea was, when we get this runtime protection in place, test it. Don't ignore it. Right? Run it to the test, be the hacker. What did the hacker do? We do it again. So we created a Postman collection, put an attack plan on it, and fire up, and let's see what happens. We realized 10 times a second is still too much, so sit down to six times a second. That's good enough. That's what we can do. The whole thing had in mind as the backdrop, we wanted to do this in a way that we say, if we can automate these steps in a further loop, we can introduce a security that starts at the beginning of the life cycle of an API and walks its way through the life cycle, and at the end is the runtime protection, which actually avoids the breach in the first place. So our game plan on the long run was different, but I said it's about the team. So why was the customer at the end happy? Yes, we fixed the breach. They're probably happy. But we fixed it in exactly four days. They approached us on a Sunday. Can you help? We had our first call on a Monday with the triage. We went through the Tuesday checking it out. And I'm, I'm telling you, I was on these calls. It was eight hours web, call, web conference. Constantly talking. What is happening? Can we look at this? We had basically Monday was just two hours. That was relatively straight. Tuesday, Wednesday, eight hour calls. Straight in. But on Thursday, we could flip the switch and says it's on again. The WAF could activate the path and we moved. And since then, no breach. That's the point. That's where we, where we come this. The trick on this was we had all the guys in place. So one of the actions, for example, we did on that uh, single patch application is we asked the developer, can, why are you using the same path for, the, for downloading the, the, the app and, using the, and calling the APIs? It's not best practice. This one is static content. This one is dynamic content. So can we set up a network call that says api.company.com? We drive the API contracts through. We can be very precise on controlling this. And we don't have to, to play around with, oh, there's an, a favor icon that needs to be downloaded. There are images coming through the same call. It's very hard to protect. If we can separate this kind of static calls for the app and the actual dynamic calls for the API, it helps a lot. That's why we needed the developer on board. Also, we needed the developer to create that initial API uh, definition because he was using C Sharp. So when he, he never did an API. So we, what we did, we asked him, can you add Swashbuckle to your C Sharp system? And next start, you have a basic understanding of your open API specification. So he doesn't need to learn open APIs back in his case. He just needs to generate it out of the code, and we can take it from there. We'll move it over to the security team. Security team looks at the, the parameters outside, what needs to do. So it was, a, was an easy one for the developer to change, but we needed him in, in, the, in the team. We needed the WAF team because we needed to have another route. But they, it was not that they had to do some weird stuff in the WAF. It was really just, can you bypass api.company.com to our firewall in the back? That was all we asked for. That's why we were so fast, basically, because the questions we asked were not kind of elaborate. They didn't need to do massive things. It was relatively short things that we can, can implement. So long-term strategy. As I said, open API specification. And we put this basically in three stages because it's not fair for a company to say, tomorrow you do something different. It just doesn't work. It, 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 no matter if the company is big or small, you always have people that object. You always have people that likes change and that don't like change. So you need to get this over, over time. So the first thing we basically ask them, just try to get this open API specification under the belt. You say, this is for governance, mostly security governance. Automate 
that security evaluation every time in a way that you say, I'm looking through the open API specification and I can find that there might be some problems. Like we said, there's a phone call and if it's a string, it's wrong. We should define it as an integer and make sure it's, it's, if it's a US number, I think it's something between 10 and 14 digits. So I can rein it down in max and min length. I can actually put a pattern on it that nothing else can go in. So I can my, get my whitelist really strict. But I can do this in an iterative way. Easing the pain for anyone, automating it, put it into the pipeline. Do the check, put it in the pipeline, get the data back to the developers, to their GitHub, GitLab, whatever they use, so they understand what they need to change. Next thing, on every pull request, so every time you do an active change in the application, do a dynamic scan against, the open, against this. So the, basically, not the code. I don't like people saying, I'm scanning the code, that's good enough. You can't find a Bola problem by scanning code. It's not possible. You only can find a Bola problem by asking the application directly live. Here's the picture of XYZ. Can I delete it with uh, ABC credentials? If that's possible, you have it. If that's not possible, you're good. So you have to do an active test against this Bola to make it work. It's nothing you can get out of the code. It has to be against the running application. A good time for this is every time the developer understands, I have good enough tests to actually go back into main from the branch. So pull request is a good timing for do this. Besides, any scan takes time. On a pull request, no one is accepting this as immediate. Everyone knows, okay, there's time, someone needs to look at it. There's a review. So the scan is not really intercepting the flow. That was phase one, or is phase one. They're still on it. They have found out that they have um, 70 applications, which are all using APIs. So I then know one, one ring to phase one to start understanding what the heck are we doing in the back, right? So that's, that's where, so stage two for us, implement quality gates. Make sure that the pipeline breaks is if it's not up to standard. So giving the security team tools to say, I want to have no Bola ever in my production system, full stop. If you find one, I break the build. That's what automation can do for you. And if you introduce this kind of security quality gates, you get ease on the developer side, but you also get ease on the security side. They start understanding and say, okay, cool. When, when this thing goes through, well, I can relax because I already ironed out all these problems before. So that's phase two hopefully get there, and we start implementing real-time protection. At the moment, at this point in time, the trick is always communicating back where the problem is. Right? You get a bola problem, how do I tell my developer what's wrong? So one of the things we started there was basically, okay, we found a problem there, it goes into Git, and they, they use GitHub, it goes into GitHub Advanced Security, GitHub Advanced Security gives you a pointer in the code where the problem is. So they don't need to guess. And fine, so they can basically walk through it, it gives you a diff and says there is the point where you need to go. It's line 55 of your code. Go, fix it. Fixing it at the end is not a problem. A Bola problem fix is literally just, can you please check that damn token correctly? In many cases, it's just a one-liner, maybe just a lapse. Like 500 applications in there, I'm building this, and I'm just missing one to put that one line in that says authorization validation. That's, that's mostly on the problems. It's not. No one builds an application deliberately to go wrong. Right? The developers want to be seen as someone that makes things work, get them done, and they should be good. So helping them to understand what the problem is and fix it easily is one of the best things you can do. And then start implementing real-time protection slowly. Not full blocking mode. They're probably not at that stage to say, I can activate full blocking mode. But maybe you can say, check the whitelist on all pass operations and the incoming requests. Because we don't understand at the beginning how, what, are the possible responses of an API call. 
because you, you don't see them all at once. The weird ones coming over time. Right? So you need that time to understand how this evol evolves over time. You use gradually, you start with the low blo blocking barrier on, the, on, on that incoming protection, and then you slowly rise it over time. At the end, that's where you want to end up. Automatic quality gate enforcement. No system goes into production without passing all quality gates. Simple. I always compare this, this sentence to, did you know how your cars are built? How many security quality gates a car has to pass before it gets on the street? It's, a, it's amazing. These guys don't talk to... If you introduce security quality gates to, to a customer that's running in, in the automotive industry, they say, yeah, of course. That's what we do all the time. You never put a new braking system in without testing it extensively to be against spec. And if it's not against spec, it will not build. Right? So we're just enforcing things that people do when it's, when it's about real-life problems. Delivery pipeline. Make sure it's actually there. Now the last thing is interesting. How do I get a new version of an API change into my real-time protection? That needs to be automated as well. If that at production system is then depending on a security team that needs to go in a UI to change the UI to a new thing, how do they cope with the development team? Taking the, what, what's the normal ratio? What do you think? Normal ratio between amount of developers, team size, and team size security teams. Who has the majority? Security teams? Not at all, right? You have 100,000 developers, maybe more. It was just up in Seattle. Um, there are 50,000 developers, and the security team is 15. So no chance, right? no way that they can do it manually. There has to be an automation way to say, can I take what I just learned about my security quality gate for my open API specification, it's good enough to pass the security gate, so can I take it and automatically pump it into the firewall? So it's up to date at the moment I say deliver. Must be the delivery pipeline that makes that work, because that's the point where you say I'm putting it out in, in the world. So that's basically the things I, I drove in that system, and where we are still working with the customers through phase one, I think, I hope we get to phase one somewhere by summer, and move on into phase two then. But the actual situation was, we focused on a few things to, to, to stop the breach, and then we thought about this, okay, what is our long-term strategy, and how can that fixing already play into what we do on the other side? Just the takeaways. Really, really critical. Try to drive awareness into the developer teams that they're using APIs, specifically when they're not specialized on building backend systems, when they're specialized, when they're basically not specialized to say, I'm a full-stack developer. Does he understand what he's doing when he's going from backend to frontend? Does he actually create an API in that stack? That his single page application, if he uses one, is helping a hacker to understand how his application works. So when you have the question in your company, do I do a native mobile app or do I single page application? Yes, of course, single page application sounds like the, more, the cheaper way of doing it. And the smarter way, because I don't need to build five, six things like Androids and right, all these things, it doesn't really work. So try to make it work with them. The rest, I think I talked about it as key takeaways. Do the automation. Do yourself a favor and automate it. It takes away the tension between the teams because the pipeline is guilty for stopping you. With that, I would say thank you for the talk.